<laughs> You're moving for the back. One, two, one, two. <laughs> so the point is, is it is is this okay? This is on. This is on. We'll just we'll just pass it back and forth because this is about making art with fewer resources than you thought you might have originally. So wonderful. So this is uh, a um, highly choreographed, mm. but hold it close, hold it close, hold it closer, and speak with a bit of a Frank's accent. Um, is it, this is this is actually projecting. Okay, fantastic. Okay, that took five minutes. I'm so sorry. The point of this conversation is to skip over the parts of the conversation that we have heard already. So in a way, we're saving time. Mm. My name is Helen Shaw. I am a critic. And I have often been in conversations in which we talk about something called the theater crisis. Oh, dear. And we seem to be in it. We seem to be buffeted by its uh, dreadful uh, weather. Um, and we spend a lot of time, at least in my experience, talking about what caused it, what it is, and less time talking about the things that people are already doing and imagining to move through these headwinds. Mm. So I wanted to talk to people with the idea of sort of solution foremost in their minds. Uh, and also, you'll notice that um, this panel uh, has a very specific constitution. So the people in um, the hot seats here are, are artistic directors. And they are specifically artistic directors who have taken their positions recently. <laughs> so um, <laughs> and we thought, why not welcome them um, with uh, this somewhat hazing-like structure um, <laughs> devised by a critic. Nothing could be more fun. So um, uh, all the way uh, uh, on the left and the r uh, right, however, we also have veteran artists. Correct, <laughs> veteran artists who have also, yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah, no, no, That's no, not emerging. No, don't think emerging, <laughs> not mid. Veteran, and also specifically artists who have been making work at all kinds of levels and also making opportunities where sometimes it seems as though there aren't any. And so we're going, here is our structure. The first 20 minutes, and I'm timing us, we will be talking to the artistic directors about a certain set of questions that I sent to them ahead of time, which I will repeat for you, about moving through the crisis. Number two, second 20 minute section. They will scramble out of their seats and the artists will move in. They will address the same set of questions and offer a um, perhaps critique, perhaps expansion, perhaps problematization of what we have heard proposed so far. And then in our third 20 minutes, they will have a conversation with each other. Because I want the emphasis of this to be both on new ideas, but also how do those new ideas serve the artists who are actually making the work and have been doing so for a long time and have experience of working in New York and its um, particular fun facts. Uh, if you do not know the folks on the panel with me, I'm going to very, very briefly introduce them. They, are all, they all have spectacular resumes and so this is going to be necessarily brief and probably thereby kind of like insulting because I'm reducing them, so I'm so sorry. Um, Morgan Basikas, who is all. Cool Basikas, I'll just let's just start Thank there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's just start there. And that's all I have on board. <laughs> Humph. Morgan is comedian, musician, writer, organizer, activist whose uh, work, Can I Be Frank, was recently at and bringing the house down at uh, the La Mama um, upstairs space and hopefully coming back. Hopefully. hopefully. At, the, at the Wilma next weekend, in case anyone wants to come in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. Philadelphia is actually a capital of culture. Uh, and um, also a very powerful piece last year, which I saw, Crowded Field, um, some of the issues of which I hope that Morgan will be happy to discuss with us today. Next to Morgan is Tyler Thomas, um, who is a director who uh, founded The Commissary, which is, um, was a pandemic era project uh, that eventually kind of, I don't know if culminated is a, is a fair word, but ha featured the performance Lessons in Survival at the Vineyard, very beautiful production. Uh, uh, that m might make you think that Taylor's work is always verbatim based. Tyler. Tyler, did I say Taylor? Have I been saying Taylor this whole time? No, that was the only time. 
I have a cousin, Taylor, um, but my dad's from Tyler, so I'll remember that. Now, um, uh, Tyler is also the winner of the Susan Stroman Award. Very fancy, very fancy. Next to Tyler, we have Caleb Hammonds, who uh, apparently performed last night under the name Parton Cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> But for today's uh, offering, I hope we'll be keeping it um, family-oriented. Uh, uh, but what? <laughs> so true. And that's all I have on Caleb. Um, Caleb is one of the um, three current artistic directors of Soho Rep, and has a um, absurd history producing uh, all over the place, but really primarily at Bard, the Richard Fisher Center. Um, where some little-known pieces like Oklahoma went on to, to glory and um, acclaim. Uh, next to Caleb. Sorry, sorry, Caleb, you can critique that later. Um, uh, we have Will Davis. Will Davis is the current artistic director of the Rattlestick Theater, um, a theater which is kind of in exile this year. <laughs> is exile too mean? Anyway, refurbishment, you know what I mean. And, uh, and so we'll be able to talk about what it is to be an artistic director when the space is I imaginary. You know. Nice. Um, next to me, Jill Rafson. Rafson, Rafson. Rafson. Only one I've gotten right tonight, kids. Uh, who is the new producing artistic director at Classic Stage Company and comes there after a long, distinguished career at Roundabout, um, uh, primarily interested in new writing. Fair? Fair. Freedom Bradley Ballantyne has um, a very interesting recent history. Um, associate artistic director um, in San Diego and now recently associate artistic director at The Public. Is that, is that the wrong title? That is the wrong title. That is the wrong institution. As of Friday of last week, I'm right. no longer with the public theater. So Breaking news! That's, <laughs> as so, of last Friday. Yes. So we had a conversation about that, which I'm hoping to have in public. And uh, next to Freedom, I'm sorry. When I thought an eight-person panel was a good idea, I didn't realize that it would just be introduction um, <laughs> uh, production. <sighs> Enver, okay, I will also probably put the emphasis on the wrong syllable here. It's Chakartash? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I get better as I get older. Um, Enver is a costume designer of uh, intense renown. Okay, next to Enver, <laughs> recent uh, Tony nomination for the extremely shoppable looks in Stereophonic. I will say, a show with a lot of artistic merit, but primarily I wanted to just wear what everybody was wearing. Um, and also, now a moment I can tell you that Singlet in 2018 is the most astonishing costume design I've ever seen really? on stage. Wow. Yeah, Thank because you. it was a character. I was God the damn, it was good. Knee surgery. <laughs> but the around. knees were the best part of it. <laughs> and then, last but not least, Tina Satter of Half Straddle, who is um, our uh, reigning um, queen of disorientation and disillusion. <laughs> Um, and uh, apparently got up to all kinds of nonsense here last night in the Elabash. And hopefully you will be doing Pedro on Kant somewhere within view soon. Yeah? Okay. Thank God. Thank God we're done. Um, and thank you so much for coming out. Um, uh, please stay. Okay. The, um, uh, I'm going to set my timer for 20 minutes. Here is my intro. Sorry. I have to, the timer and the intro is on the phone, which is, anyway, someone made that plan. It was me. Uh, okay, so the financial difficulty that the theater finds itself in now is part of a perfect storm of three interrelated issues. Number one, we have fewer people coming to the theater than we did before the pandemic. It is the diminishment of an audience that we, um, we saw the vector heading in that direction before the pandemic. It has continued after it. That is not universal, but it has been something which has affected the field at large. Second, there has been a diminishing interest in philanthropic funding for the arts, um, both because um, wealth in this country has shifted from one group to another. <laughs> 
just to put it mildly, and uh, partially because uh, philanth uh, philanthropic giving has also changed its focus, um, particularly in the last four years. Um, and in addition to funding and uh, attendance, there is the issue of rising costs, both on the labor front and on the materials front. Now, it, I don't think, I, I think that that is uncontroversial, that those are three of the major issues facing us. Um, there are other less sort of pinpointable issues that have to do with New York in particular, I think. Uh, price of, um, uh, just the, the, the price of parking as uh, Freedom uh, faced just uh, 20 minutes ago is, uh, is one of them. Uh, <laughs> but the cost of living infrastructure decay that we're all dealing with um, and the sort of particular questions of our own audience and, and buildings are, um, are, are sometimes not so easy to confront. And so our conversation is hopefully uh, going to talk about what are the solutions to how to serve artists when the headwinds are of that nature. So I'd like to start with the artistic directors. So, Caleb, you knew this question was coming because you got all the questions in advance. Did you read it? Did you read yeah, the but I didn't think I would have to go first, but that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, introduce, you, would you uh, introduce yourself and the, your institution, your specific audience, and who you think you serve specifically? Hi, I'm Caleb Hammonds. Um, uh, I am one of the co-directors of Soho Rep. Um, if anyone doesn't know Soho Rep, we are uh, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, kicking off our 49th season, um, which is uh, wild to think about. Um, but we are uh, an off-Broadway theater that is devoted to um, tailor-made um, production and development processes for radical artists at critical junctures in their practices. And happy to dive into what we mean by what we, when we say any of those words, but um, we uh, are an off-Broadway theater. We do three productions a year. Um, for one more production, those have happened since 1991 in a 65-seat uh, black box theater on Walker Street in Tribeca, which is not in Soho. Um, <laughs> but Soho Rep has not been in Soho since its first like 10 years of <laughs> existence. Um, our audience, so I, and, and like, like to maybe just um, paraphrase Chapel Roan, um, I, I try to think about our audience as, uh, or like us as your favorite theater artist's favorite theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that what we have been serving and are trying to serve is, uh, is, is theater artists and theater lovers and people who are interested in uh, being part of uh, an organization and a community and a process that is focusing predominantly on um, experimentation and um, trying to carry forward some sense of uh, avant-gardeness, whatever that means and to um, really center artists uh, in everything that we do in terms of um, autonomy, artistic autonomy, in terms of um, equitable compensation, and in terms of um, bringing artists into uh, the staff and artists into uh, the board and all levels of leadership and all levels of decision making and all levels of uh, the way that we operate and exist. Thank you. Will. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, hi, um, I'm Will Davis. He, him, yes. Um, and I am the artistic director of Rattlestick Theater. I'm Rattlestick's third artistic director in 31 years. Um, Rattlestick has been at 224 Waverly Place in the West Village that entire time. Um, you've all been there. You know where the bathrooms are. Um, 
that's the theater I run. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's important to say I'm a year and a half in, um, and uh, I also want you to know that um, on a good day, if the wind's not blowing too hard, Rattlesticks operating budget is a million and a half. Um, this organization is, um, I, w I want to talk about money actually yeah. quickly, um, from a budget point of view, because it speaks to some of the things you're talking about. Um, Rattlestick does not, <laughs> I have more than 65 seats, but not much. Um, and one of the reasons I took this job is because of that, because there was nothing I could program that would ever sell enough tickets to make an appreciable difference to the budget. So I am free to program according to my values and ethics and the values and ethics of the institution. What that does mean is that I raise the operating budget. So <clears throat> anyone wants to have dinner later, just let me know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm fun, you know, <laughs> or quiet. I'm flexible, yeah. Um, uh, what I want to say about what Rattlestick does is that is very much in motion right now. Um, uh, my aspirations, and we are starting to pilot some programs around this right now. It's not even programs. We're starting to pilot some structures around this right now, which is it is my intent to refocus the theater around process. Um, it really, I'm just going to use words that are synonymous to Caleb's words, so I don't, I just want to own that. Um, uh, I'm interested in artistic attunement. I'm interested in figuring out how, what for me feels like just a very basic trans pedagogy, which is like, I don't, you artist, you piece, I don't tell you what your name is. I don't tell you what your deal is. You tell me, and then I go out and figure out what I can gather and offer you as a gift. And then you tell me if that's actually a gift. And if it's not a gift, I go back and find something else. So in order to do that, I need time. In order to get time, I need money. So some of the things um, that I've actually been hearing a lot of my colleagues talk about, which is exciting, is that Rattlesick will no longer be announcing seasons. We're moving away from this like time-banded idea that within a certain set of months, we produce a certain amount of work. And that certain amount of work will take this many weeks to do this, and this many weeks to do this, and then it will do that. I want to free ourselves from the headwinds. I just am like, don't walk into the wind. That, you don't have to do it. So I am, Rattlestick is tiny enough that I don't have to suffer through much bureaucracy. I can just say, because I have a very supportive board, <laughs> and, you know, and I now have my own crew as of a month ago, we're going this way, and as long as we all agree, we go that way. So um, I would say, uh, I just found out that I'm not an artist anymore, Helen, <laughs> which is <laughs> tough for me. <laughs> because <laughs> um, I'm sitting in this chair. Um, but I'm a director and a choreographer. I, I come to the theater through dance, and so um, I'm interested in work that is focused on all of the languages we speak on stage, just briefly, space, time, text, body, objects, like, those are the th like how those things speak to each other is what liveness, the liveness I want to cherish. I'm interested in theatrical events. And I'm interested in work that's being made inside all, not inside, with, around, because of all of the different ways that we approach what the theater is, which I understand to be a group project. Um, so I want to support and uplift um, artists who are working just in other ways. And I would just briefly give an example, or I won't. I won't. Excellent. So, um, sorry, let me just ask a very specific question. What's the budget of Soar Rep? Uh, on a, wait to use your language, with the wind, <laughs> the wind is blowing. Um, it's around three and a half million at the moment. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Which also will start to change considerably because we are also about to leave our home of 30 years. Yes. We can talk about that later. Yes, yes, yes. Hi. So will you introduce yourself and your institution? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill. So I'm at Classic Stage Company, and I've been there for just a touch over two years now. Um, <laughs> Classic Stage, or CSC, has been around for about 57 years. Uh, we're not a place that has had very, very long reigns of artistic directors. We've had like seven or eight people over that time. Um, and uh, 
We operate out of a former carriage house on 13th Street, uh, right by 3rd Avenue next to the Taco Bell. Very handy in tech. And um, we, we have a sort of scrappy vibe to us. You walk into that space and it is a thrust theater. It's all wood, it's all brick, it all feels historic, um, which uh, means it needs a lot of love and repairs. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know about CSE is that we don't own that space, even though we've been in it for over 50 years. We're on short-term leases. And um, something very interesting to get into around space, I think, for all of us is we have one of those lovely triple net leases. So we're also responsible for repairing everything, even though we do not own the building. Um, that's part of what drove Second Stage out of the Tony Kaiser. So it's been a really interesting thing to talk about lately. Um, CSC is about reimagining the classics for today's theater goers. And who is our audience? I don't know. It's changing. And I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to come to CSC. As Helen mentioned, I come out of a new work background for 17 years. I was all about emerging playwrights and new play development and getting emerging artists their Broadway debuts. And, um, and so the fact that CSC wanted my new play energy infused into programming of the classics was, was what really appealed to me because I think that if you continued to just program the classics we already accept as part of the classical canon, um, you're appealing to one audience that is going away was already going away, and then we had a pandemic, so now they're really going away. And so I get to do the work of rebuilding our audience and trying to program work that I find really exciting that I think I would want to come see. So it's about expanding the definition of what we mean by a classic, and I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we bust open the canon? How do we make room for more voices? How do we either rediscover voices that were sort of trampled by history, or how do we get today's greatest artists working on whatever classic they've never been given access access to, to put their stamp on it, or to do a fresh adaptation that breathes new life into it and brings that into our space. That's the fun and exciting stuff that I wish I got to spend more time on. Um, but as Will said, there's a whole lot of fundraising in all of our lives right now. Um, CSE, when I arrived, was operating on a budget of a little bit over $4 million. We're now closer to 3.3, very intentionally. Um, I think one of the big questions that, that is on my mind is how much work when how much work can you do with fewer resources, um, with expenses so much higher? And so we're actually managing to do a very similar amount of work with a lot less money, but we're just doing it in different ways. We're less tied to what used to be a three or four production season, and that's it. More one-off events, more opportunities to just get artists in the door. And I should say another change that's that's important for us is that um, while I, I too think of myself as an artist, even though I'm in this chair, um, but I'm a dramaturg at heart, um, and I will never direct. I'm the first person to lead CSC who is not a director. And so I get to open up my theater as a playground to all the directors I really admire. And so there's so many more opportunities for CSC to be less insular, which I think is something the classics in general need anyway. And so I spend a lot of time trying to infuse that energy into what we're doing at CSC today. Thank you. So Freedom, it's a little tricky to ask you to speak for an institution um, with which you are no longer associated. But yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you came there to do. I've been fortunate to work for uh, several large organizations and institutions, um, and, and it's always been very easy for me to identify who our communities are, because the institutions themselves are so large and take up so many resources that generally it's for the entire city of either New York or San Diego. So who are the people within those cities that we're looking to, to uh, connect with? And mostly, I consider myself in line with uh, Zelda Fitch Andler, Tyrone Guthrie, Joe Papp. I'm trying to make theater that is democratic and for and of and by the people, which is where the public theater is and in, in, has always been in that being our ethos. Uh, I want to make theater that is, connect, that is available for people regardless of money, regardless of geography, geography, regardless of, of, um, of interest in theater. The, 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 my favorite piece of theater that I actually saw this year was uh, a movie called Sing Sing that took place in a correctional facility. But it was about a 
people making a play within that correctional facility. So how are we opening up our doors to allow people to have the keys of making art? How are we using the art to be transformative to society? That's what's really interesting to me. That's what I think uh, where we as a field should be looking at and going <laughs> to. How are we able to make art that, uh, that is a service to the public good, which is when I talk about being in line with the Tyrone Guthrie or with those other giants of the regional theater, they, they set up this thing so that we could do risky work, but also that we could be of service. That's why we're not for profit, to be of service of the people. So most of my work is trying to do that. Um, it is very uh, much either, either people creating their own work either partnering with artists so that communities can make that work, or looking at classics and reinterpreting them, or working with younger artists, or, or artists that um, may not have all of the resources uh, that, that uh, you know, the labels of all this is so fucking tricky every now and then. You know, like, but, but they're not, they're not uh, you know, like, uh, like a Kenny Leon, you know, like someone who's really super successful. I'm, I'm interested in working with someone who maybe not have, like Tyler, like someone who, may, who maybe people don't know, but has a voice and has something that they want to say and has something and has a real connection to the work. Uh, not, that, not that Mr. Leon does not. He has a total connection to the work. But that's who I'm really looking forward to working with. Can you talk a little bit about why or, or if not, why the conditions under which you are no longer at the public? Well, the, the public theater used to be a $50 million theater. Um, it used to be a $50 million theater. That was, you know, before the pandemic. It's no longer a $50 million theater. The work that's really interesting to me <coughs> how is it said to me? Because I want to be careful with how, I, th how this was said. It was said, you know, um, quote, we're going to eliminate your position. Has nothing to do with your performance. Has everything to do with the financial situation and what we find ourselves in. And we're not able to produce at the level that we, that we thought we would be. And there's not a lot of work to be done. So the thing that I'm interested in is winding up, you know, to a large degree being cut. The work that, that really connects the company with, you know, community. And you can go to Under the Radar. We can look at, you know, the work that's done in Hunts Point. We can look at the work that's done in, you know, the mobile unit. We can look at the work that's done on, in public works. All those programs are seeing significant and drastic reductions. So, I mean, you don't really hire me to, you know, like dismantle shit. You hire me to like build stuff. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm there for. I'm there to build programs. So, you know, when you get to that point where it's like, all right, we're at this crossroads and what are we gonna do? Mm. Mm. You know, doesn't make, it doesn't make much sense to have my skill set in the building. So um, the question that I bolded for the panel, um, uh, because I, I feel like it's kind of the core idea of, of asking people who are new in these positions, and I realize I'm using new pretty sloppily, but it's New York. We have people who run theaters for like 40 and 50 years at a time. So if you've been in your position for two years, you're a baby. Um, and an artist, I'm sorry. You're all artists. <laughs> And everyone over there is an artistic director. Yes, actually. Yeah, yes. that's yeah. right. That's the yeah. thing. Yes. That was why uh, we. Yeah, yeah. Um, is was this was this question here? Is that when you joined your institution, they must have asked you, well, what are you going to do, given <laughs> that things are tricky at the moment. They might have used more expletives, or they might have used uh, more, m more elegant language. But they would have said, what will you do? What, what choice, what programming choice, what budgeting choice, what, 
What innovative step can you think of, can you bring from your earlier position? So what thing can you import from BARD that will work here, for instance, in Caleb's case? And so I'd love for you to talk about your the steps, the innovations, I understand that budget reduction is a big, is a big component, is a big intentional component, um, that each of you have done that you feel that you are in the process of executing this year. Part, part I can just answer Please this do. because yeah. it's, it's clear in my mind. Um, you know, part of what I was brought in to do was to make sure that we were going back into the, the mission of what the public theater is supposed to be doing. It was also a rough time. It was also a time for people to really, you know, to increase morale around the building. When I got there, no one was in the building. The building was empty. There was junk and trash throughout the building. Uh, and my job when I got there was to make sure that people were coming back in and making sure that the, that the programs themselves had a sense of camaraderie, you know, had a sense of belonging felt like they weren't being marginalized onto the side, but were the main course. And that's what I came to the, to the theater to do. I came to the theater to make sure that we had a clear mission statement, a clear vision, a clear values, that we were all move, moving toward that, that we were all you know, looking at that and judging ourselves against that. Mm. Now, I was totally unsuccessful in this. <laughs> you know, those, these things have not, you know, in most of it. Um, Getting more camaraderie, yes. Making sure that people, at least in my department, felt seen and heard and, and part of it, uh, yes. That they felt like someone was there to, to advocate for them and make sure that their programs weren't suffering, yes. I was able to do that. But as far as making the whole, of, of, of moving that work into the center of the organization, I was not successful in that. You know, And that's because of a lot of different reasons but we were not able to do that. And to me, that is the work that is essential for any of our not-for-profit theaters. I mean, I'll say that for, for my institution, I, I actually think that the first year was about identifying that there were problems to be solved, because I'm not sure that it was so clear cut at every organization that, yeah, the finances are a little tough, we're still post-pandemic, but it'll return to normal. I think everyone still thought things were going to normalize when I was getting started. And, um, and so it took a minute to kind of dig into things and, and get my footing and go, wait, here are the things that I am seeing, and start to witness things myself, and then spend my second year going, okay, and now here's what I'm going to do about it. So I do feel like the solution creating um, is still a little bit newer. And I'll say that the ways that I'm approaching it um, uh, kind of come from the fact that we have this building and, uh, and I keep thinking about the fact that we can't produce in it nearly as often as I want to be producing and it's just sitting there. And again, I'm paying rent on it no matter what and fixing the HVAC no matter what. I spent so much time on HVAC. Um, I mean, don't we all? So I think I've really come around to the idea of I knew we'd had a lot of conversations among my board and my staff about activating the space. How do we make better use, but also how do we make better use with limited bandwidth? Because you know my staff has ranged in size over my two years from a max of 11 to a minimum of six. You know There weren't enough people to get done all that extra new kinds of programming that I wanted to bring in. And so the idea that I'm now playing with that's really still in its infancy, but that I sort of proposed to the room is what happens if we try to raise all boats in this moment where our industry is seeing contraction. What does it look like in particular for an off-Broadway theater that does the classics to try to do something that supports the idea of the classics off-Broadway more generally? Because most of my colleagues who do work around that mission don't have a space. So what happens if I open up my doors? What could it look like to make some noise for reimagining the classics off-Broadway more generally, take a little bit of CSE ego out of it, and say, we have a room. Who wants to come into it? Can this help all of us? What are the efficiencies that we can find by working together, whether that's you know, on the back end stuff, whether that's in marketing opportunities together. I don't know what that's gonna look like, but it's certainly the thing that's front of mind for me right now. And I really admire a lot of the collaborations that are along those same lines that I'm starting to see. I mean, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about where Soho Rep is placed and what's happening with the space at Signature, but how are people going to take the resources that they do have and support their own bottom line and their own missions and maybe invite other people in as well? 
Well, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate for the situation that I walked into for a number of reasons, because it is a co-directorship, which is uh, an incredible thing, <laughs> let me tell you, um, to have uh, two other people uh, who have different, you know, have had different experiences, life experiences, work experiences, um, that for the three of us to be able to be in dialogue and conversation together about every decision is amazing. So, and uh, I joined at the, with one other person at a time when two of the current three directors left, and so we also <laughs> had the benefit of one person sticking along. I think also just as a organization that's a, almost 50 years old, Soho Rep has never has never really been one thing or in one place, and sometimes people, as we've been talking about, like uh, preparing for this fiftieth fiftieth anniversary, <laughs> that you know people will say a lot to us like, oh well, Soho Rep, there's constant reinvention, constant reinvention, and I actually think that it's it's more organic than that. It's not just like one day someone was like, boom, now we're changing this. Um, but you know, it was like Soho Rep started as, uh, and the, the, the directors that started Soho Rep did so because they were at CSC and were like, no, we want to go do classics our own way. <laughs> so it was a classical theater when, it's, when it opened. And um, the organic, uh, trajectory from there, which was really about, I think, just the group of people that were gathering around what the organization was and emerging as a home for um, what was becoming a more, uh, the, the folks who were like, we're, we're part of this downtown avant-garde, but, but we're also just writing plays. Not just writing plays, but we are actually writing plays. We're like writing scripts. And so it was like, okay, so this is the place we'll do that now. And so, but I think like as that uh, trajectory has continued, that there was another major organic shift that happened um, right after, during and right after the pandemic, which all credit to um, my predecessors, uh, Sarah Benson, Ropi Papandes, and Cynthia Flowers, who like decided at that time, like, okay, this is actually our moment as an organization to completely rethink how um, we are actually centering artists at, at, in what we do. and they created something called Project Number One, which brought eight artists on full-time staff for uh, a year uh, in which no live performance was happening with the entire, uh, th with the entire purpose being like, we want to employ you and we also want you to help us think what should we be doing when we start doing sh shows again. And the biggest thing that came out of that was, um, uh, uh, principles of equitable artist compensation. And that also completely transformed the way that we as an organization um, think about our budget, think about the way that we distribute our resources, and think about how all of those things connect with each other. Obviously, n no one wanted to come in and be like, we're getting rid of that, you know, like, so. Um, <laughs> But uh, but but I think that you know when in in terms of this like I question of like what was asked of you. So the other the other part that I think is um, was a little bit unique about the process of interviewing and and starting for this position was it was basically like um, so we're we have to leave this building, <laughs> and so um, when you start that's what you got to figure out. And so it was kind of like, well, we, you know, like think about all the, like, like you can think about what you want to do and all of these ideas, but actually this is the, this, this is the big like container that you have to do that through. And so there, were, it almost in some ways felt like a gift because it was actually saying, um, this is your challenge now think about what you are going to do with that. And um, 
so, <laughs> so we are leaving our building, um, which we have also leased for 35 years and in similar sense had to fix everything. And then the building was sold and we were like, you know what, now it's time. This is the moment. And um, part of what then uh, my co-director Eric Ting and I were able to do when we entered is pick up with Cynthia to start to think about um, and how, what that's going to look like. And for us, the foundational question was, what do we want to hang on to and what do we want to leave behind? And that was really what kicked off everything that has since developed and emerged about the way that we're thinking about the future of the organization, which is, um, you know, besides all of the kind of like grant speak language, like in the simplest terms, it is, Artists should be trusted, artists should lead the way, artists should be paid a living wage, and theater should be accessible to everyone, especially the artists and the people who are making it. And that if you invest in those things, that um, and you really believe those things, that audiences will um, be attracted because the artists are uh, have agency, the artists have authority, and the artists are deeply engaged with the work. That's the thing we're trying to take with us. And uh, the challenge that I think we are still um, in process of thinking through uh, is the fact that um, audiences, get, getting an audience, it's not easy when you have, it's not easy at any point in time if you have five seats or you have 500 seats. But when you do have 65 seats, it's not always the thing that is, is challenging you the most. But we are now in um, this interim phase of our journey where we will be in residence at Playwrights Horizons for two to three seasons. We are um, essentially working toward doubling our capacity, which is um, actually in some ways very helpful because <laughs> as we have continued to follow the tenants that were set forward in project number one and have been um, raising artist compensation, we um, actually you know, like having more income from additional seats, even sticking to our principles of affordable, accessible ticket prices, it actually helps us out in the long run because we are already paying people, um, sometimes in, more, in, in many cases, more than theaters that twice or three times the size of ours are paying artists. Humble brag. <laughs> but I also feel like it's very important, and part of what we want to focus on is talking about that, mm. talking about how we did it, why we did it, and also what is really hard about it. Mm. Because if we're the only, I think we're realizing that it's like, if we're the only place doing this, that is not um, initiating a sea change that we want it to, to be. And so um, if anyone wants to talk about at any point how we did it, why it is hard, how it is hard, happy to talk about it, especially with funders. So I, um, Will, can you do yes. it in one minute and yes. 30 seconds? Yes, oh, I love that. Um, the things that I wanted to talk about when I was um, considering taking this job um, was uh, systems and access. Mm -hmm. That could tell you more. I could stop right there. But that was 30 seconds. <sighs> Abundance! <laughs> um, uh, I'm a new play director. I'm, I'm as interested in how we make it as I am in what we make. And I think one of the things that we can really do as a company to meet the moment is to dig into how we're making it. Um, and that's what I mean by attunement, and that's what I mean by just like letting go, not throwing away, but just walking the other direction from these things that were like, this is broken, this is on fire, and everyone's like, maybe if we change it a little, 
then we could like pick it up again. Just not, let it be, like let it go. Let's let's actually think about again to Caleb's amazing point. You know, if if we at Rattlestick, if we are centering this idea of process, and process is a very bespoke thing, how do we then organize and create systems that respond to that? And so it is my plan over the next five years to remake Rattlestick with a series of systems that are responding to that. And the access piece, I can do in one sentence or not. Mm -hmm. The access piece is this. No clauses. No, oh, fuck me. OK, here it is. <laughs> There are two sides, there are two sides as I see it to access. Everything is better off the binary, sorry. Um, but in this case, in this case, I think that audiences deserve the respect of having access to artists in process. And I think they'd be quite interested to know how we make what we make. We all know this to be true. On the other side, I think that artists deserve access to audiences earlier. There's a reason why we have previews. We learn what the show is after the last collaborator shows up. And then we're like, oh my god, that's terrible. And we're all like, yes, it's terrible. Cut it. So I am interested in programming in such a way that, yes, we will do some full productions. Uh, and also, we will do work where the point is that both sides, artists and audiences, are meeting each other at an access point, and that we are meaningfully collaborating, actually, and that it is of service to the artist and is of service to audience cultivation. Excellent. Okay. And a miracle of compression, I would say. Okay, artistic directors, will you trade places? <laughs> and artists, I know you're artists as well. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> will you <laughs> trade yeah. places? Well, I don't know. I mean, have, if you've developed an attachment to your mic, everybody, yeah, yeah, nice. Oh my god! Continuing our dynamic. I didn't realize there was going to be fighting over chairs, but I'm, in a way. I think that, Helen, you should have taken away one chair. Oh. Uh. <laughs> we can discuss the semiotics of the critic always having her own chair in another time. Um, the, the, so my question for uh, the four of you is, of course, to reflect on what you've heard. But if I could also just propose this <coughs> as a possible question, because they might like to hear it. They might need to hear it is what is a time in your work when you have felt really served by an institution, really held, really supported, and the work that you did with that institution could not have happened outside of it? Um, and what was it that made that, um, made that relationship so strong? Um, is it okay if I just straight up ask you? I feel like I always have to ask my students permission to cold call on them, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, Morgan. Um, hello. Um, I, um, I, you know, I, I'm very predictable. I will be talking about the boycott of Israel. Let's just be transparent. <laughs> um, but, um, but, and I thought I was going to have to make, be, be re really random. But actually, this conversation, like, it actually feels so deeply uh, relevant. And because when you're asking about institutions when I felt most support, it's, it's the brave institutions that have endorsed the cultural boycott of Israel. And these are the institutions, when, when the Poetry Project, legendary 50-year-old institution out of St. Mark's Church um, in the East Village, when they said, we will not just program Palestinians, but we will stand with Palestinians. We will stand with the millions of people around the world who are horrified beyond belief at witnessing children's limbs in bags, right? At witnessing families on fire. When they did that, I, I became a lifelong devotee of the Poetry Project. I already was. I've, I've, been, I've performed there, I've, you know, like I love them. I, but now I'm like, I will do anything for you. And it's the same with the small presses that have endorsed the cultural boycott. When they have stepped out and said, we will not just uh, try to enact our politics through representation, which at worst can be a kind of optic, kind of multiculturalism, and the artistic directors talked about what's well, deeper than that. To me, the endorsing the boycott of Israel, which was which was called in 2004 by Palestinians, it was actually called before the the cultural boycott, the cultural and academic boycott was called first, before it was even called to boycott the Israeli institutions, the larger ones. And I want to I want to and you'll move me on, um, but um, the cultural boycott of South Africa was started by playwrights. 
And that feels so important in this room, that it was playwrights in 1963, 48 playwrights who signed a letter, including Arthur Miller, Samuel Beckett, Harold Pinter, saying we will not allow our plays to be performed in segregated theaters in South Africa. It started with playwrights. And that to me is like so important for us to root in. And obviously when, you know, those of us who, you know, like who lived through South Africa, the cultural boycott was essential for dismantling it. So to me, and I'll stop here, right? Um, I could go on for hours. The indignity. OK, um, I'm just a narcissist. OK, the, um, um, how do I get to Broadway? OK, um, this is the way. This is going to get me to Broadway. I, I've heard that boycotting Israel is the direct, yeah, stru- the direct path. Right. That's why I've chosen it. Um, it makes me an attractive candidate, right, to program? Um, the blacklist is good or bad? Um, OK. Um, and I want to say this, you know, like, I, and I'm, you know, um, I'll say f- uh, as a Jewish person to have the U.S. war machine being using, using Jewish people um, is like a, 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 a feeling, the most disgusting feeling I think I've ever felt in my entire life. And uh, all of us should feel some flavor of that feeling, given that it's our money our going towards massacring Palestinians. Um, and to me, when institutions follow what I promise you is the vast majority of the artists you work with, the actors, the playwrights, the designers, probably many people on your staff who want this boycott, and when you actually stand up to our fears that come up, and I can talk about that the next time I'm asked a question um, about what do we do with the fears, you will develop, you will revivify your audience in ways that you have never imagined. And you will develop a devotion of your artists to you who will see in you institutions of the future, not like the Democrats tacking right, losing their base, right, but actually meeting the moment. So that's my actually real response. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, Soon at the St. James, I think, Um, your piece. The St. James on Broadway, is, as you were saying. Oh. As you were saying, it's a path to, it's a path to cultural domination. Um, yeah, I, I didn't get that joke. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was both, uh, both bad, but also um, on the mic. Um, now, on the one hand, you might think that's hard to follow, Enver. <laughs> I knew it was going to be. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I often don't feel like the artist uh, when I'm in working in an institution, I feel like I'm an, an independent contractor who's been hired to do the clothes, if I'm honest. And I feel like, I think my experience of working in institutions is that their idea of how a designer works is so rigid and binary and unimaginative. And often, I have to come up against that. And it's challenging. And I, and I think that, yeah, I, I feel like I rarely feel like the artist. And often the artist, who is the director or the playwright, is the person that is advocating for me, um, if I'm honest. And I would love to be treated like an artist. I would love it. It would be, I think I have a lot to offer an institution. You know, I have a very, um, I come from downtown theater, I come from making with nothing, and I've experienced all paradigms of theater making and performance making, and I feel often like, I think other designers can relate to this, I feel often like quite undervalued by institutions. Um, But I still show up and I still do my job, you know? Um, But yeah, often it's really dependent on my relationship with the other collaborators and, yeah, that's, I think that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> that. What that raises for me is the idea of project number one being, being sort of a, uh, obviously this kind of idea of long-term engagement. And is there, would it be interesting to you, my sister's a sound designer and I've asked her sometimes if she dreams of sort of a residency of that type, of sort of being a, a, a employed somewhere for a season, being part of the planning and the idea making. And I, my impression is, and now I'm speaking for her and I'm probably getting it wrong, is that actually she, she, she doesn't want that um, because um, that she, has, she has been in the other pattern for so long. And I, does, that, does that appeal to you? Do you feel that there is, a, there is a radically different sort of 
sort of metronome to, to your engagement with a theater that would, that would work better? I mean, I do firmly believe that like continued engagement with people, like when you're talking about like setting up, you know, whatever it is, like whoever you're trying to develop or mentor, you want to engage with them constantly and you want that engagement to be recurring, right? Like I make a point to work with young people, like my assistants and my associates are all young people who haven't been to grad school because I didn't go to grad school. I didn't even go to school for design. Um, and I make it a point to mentor them and to teach them about the industry and what to expect and how to navigate these like crazy systems and these crazy like demands and deliverables that are, you know, put on us. Um, and often we're working like the, I, I feel like the institutions, like they give us these deliverables, but it's like, I'm just a person uh, designing a show. You know what I mean? Like I don't have the resources to have like a studio. Um, I don't have like, 20 people working for me. Oh. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I, I don't know if if recurring engagement, I mean, I've worked at Soho Rep a number of times, I've worked at Playwrights Horizons a number of times, I've, I've had recurring engagement, like I work with Tina all the time, you know, and you develop these kinds of really wonderful relationships, but you also don't want to hog all the work mm. at the same time. It's like important that you let other people work and it's important that you, you um, let other people and young people especially, and I, and I worry for young people. I worry for the younger artists who are coming up who don't have, because of what's happening in our landscape, don't have the same kind of opportunities we had. Like we got to make things at like Coil Festival or we got to, you know, there were all of these things that were happening where we had no money and we got to make things. And um, that's so hard to do for young people now. And often they're met with these, um, deliverables and these demands and these like unrealistic budgets and they don't know how to advocate for themselves. They don't know how to like navigate those kinds of scenarios. So often they are kind of left to their own devices and they might not succeed unless they have a mentor. Mm. So I think that I would be interested maybe in like an institution kind of instilling like a mentorship program where they bring in designers to mentor young designers who are given a show to help them navigate through it because it's it's the only way to like keep, it's the only way to help people find their point of view. Mm. I think that so few artists are allowed the <laughs> opportunity to work uh, over and over again enough to figure out who they are as an artist, like what kind of work they wanna make, especially designers. And I think giving people the opportunity to do that um, could be really interesting. Thank you. Tyler. Oh yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, I would say probably the experience that comes to mind most immediately is working with the Vineyard on a piece called Lessons in Survival. Um, Helen mentioned, I, I, wasn't, I wouldn't call myself the founder of the commissary, but I would say I was one of the founding members. Um, and it's about a 40 person um, collective of theater artists, multi-generational. And we started working together in the pandemic just as a reading group. Um, and then in response to George Floyd's murder, asked ourselves, like kind of all of us, what do we do now? You know? And we started working on this project um, that was reinvestigating interviews with black radical artists from the 60s um, and reperforming them in real time. So listening to the interview and then speaking after everything, speaking their words directly after them. And so even when we performed it virtually, <laughs> the actors, you know, we were just there on Zoom. I would say one, two, three, press play at the same time. And then they would just, you would go into this type of trance, you know? Um, and then when we did it, it, we had the opportunity to do it in person at the Vineyard and we used the same mechanism. And I would say the impact that that process had on me, which is so funny, also I don't identify as a veteran artist either, but I love being on stage with them. Um, I would say some of the impacts that Sarah and that institution had on me, um, there's so, so many, because it was a particularly transformative moment for me as an early career artist, um, where someone really took a chance on an idea and also one that had like 20 people attached to it, you know? Um, and I would say Sarah Stern and that institution really helped me to become a leader 
she, the way that we were able to collaborate, I was able to bring the questions of my, the 20 uh, actors that were involved, of my designers, and they really held them with us. And we asked, well, can we get paid a living wage? And there's 20 of us. <laughs> well, how do we figure out how to do that, you know? So we really sort of stepped in, and this is in the summer of 2020, figuring out, all right, well, how are we gonna make this happen? How are we gonna send technology to 20 people wherever they are, some folks who are in other countries? And then also, how do we speak to what matters to them about process? How do we really consider how we're making this work at the same time that we're making it? And how do we think about audience in terms of really the people that we're speaking to, not just our own theater communities? And so there was just such a richness of inquiry, not only in what we were, that like completely married what we were making it to how we were making it, but also this real attention to the organism, the body of collaborators that were making the project at the time. And um, yeah, I just really appreciated being a partner with her in that work. Um, and I learned a lot. And the other thing I would say maybe relates to what you're talking about, Vim, Enver. Um, that project we got to do virtually a couple times. Uh, we got to do it in person. And now we're in conversations about how to continue bringing that into partnerships further in the community in connections with the NY, um, with public libraries, et cetera. And so there's this kind of magic that happens when you have the ability to return to an idea. And so the gift of a return, you know, when you go to a museum, you can sort of walk through the space and you can come back to a painting that hasn't finished telling you all that it has to tell you about it. So I really appreciate this sort of, we've kind of created a campfire around this idea, around these stories, around this technique. And there's a real willingness to sort of pull the string to the end of its rope that I think dismantles, who was talking about how we dismantle seasons? It came up in a couple conversations. But um, yeah, how do you take an idea as far as it can go and perhaps as far as it needs to, particularly when it's trying to communicate to us about something that's very urgent in terms of how do we survive in, in uh, seasons of collapse and decline? So, Thank you. Tina. Um, I'm echoing Tyler on that it's a specific institution that I, it was in the kitchen mm -hmm. under Yumi Tan. Um, it's a new thing, I don't oh, I didn't turn it on. I didn't turn it on. <laughs> so I said, you probably heard it, but the kitchen under Lumi Tan and echoing, like, it was so formative. And it, I think kind of different reasons, same reasons, but different yeah. things that, as Tyler's saying, um, the only place. And then I worked at the other places after, so real, I was taking it for granted at the kitchen. The only place who was like, when they said, what do you want to do, and meant it, <laughs> like literally everyone says that, they were the ones who meant it. And then you had this holistic conversation from the beginning, because it wasn't like there was piles of money. So you're like, here's what I want to make. They're like, here's the budget we have. You just, from the beginning, were having this super transparent, candid conversation that was totally artist focused and that everyone says that also and that I haven't worked at any places with you all though I know any of you so I'm not but it's like all language unless you've been through it and they really brought it I mean we made is this a room no one they don't no one even sees it there until it goes up on stage which for me personally was very freeing like I didn't need their eyes on it <laughs> you know they see it but like if I had wanted them they would have but it just wasn't part of my process and so that's the place where you just truly had artistic freedom within this institution. So you had that validation of being within their walls. And I know there's so many different reasons why they can offer what they offered and why it's harder when you, different kinds of houses and funding and stuff. But that was an incredibly special formative place to have, really similar to how Tyler's describing it, like just making what you want to make and knowing then you had this stage and their supportive audience. It, it's literally artist and life changing. I think that the, um, what has come up in a lot of them, a lot of these uh, remarks, um, starting with freedom talking about the empty halls of the public, is that um, a lot of the, the moments when things actually seem to work is when people actually address this question of loneliness. Um, and the, the sort of the radically enormous group of people who made uh, up the commissary. I mean, it was far too many people who would ever perform in a show, which is, and, and, and that was so egoless to have a group of people who were all working together on, a, on the same project, and yet the sort of 
um, the, the sort of typical structure of who's going to be in the spotlight um, had been sort of put aside for the moment. And part of that is because we were in the specific structured lon loneliness of the pandemic, but also I think it was part of the project itself, was that the project was, um, was openly and nakedly political. Um, and politics are about, um, you know, alliances of sometimes not like-minded people. Um, and that in a way what, what Morgan is talking about, I, I think also is that the response to despair is action and activism and asking for uh, people to join in an already large group that, um, that, uh, that, it is, that the atomization of a kind of online life is, is the way that we lead to a kind of nihilist and helpless uh, passivity. Um, I don't know if that may be a ridiculous comparison, but, but uh, I think that it is the one thing that, the great thing about a theater is that the theater isn't working until people show up in the building. Um, as Freedom said, you just have got to get the trash out of the hallways and the people in the rooms. <laughs> or not, there's, you know, trash can also be uh, recycled. Um, so, uh, so just so you know, this was all really brilliantly timed out. Um, the first section took only 20 minutes, as you can all remember. Um, this second <laughs> section has also taken 20 minutes on the nail. Um, but what I want to do is I would like to, it, for it to be an eight-person conversation and maybe also a sort of a 48-person conversation as well at this point. Um, uh, because, so Caleb knows about this little obsession of mine, is the 13P website. Oh, yeah. 13P is one of my favorite projects that has ever happened in my sort of life in New York. A beautiful decentralized thing made from people working very hard for nothing, but in which the, um, the, 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 the sort of the rough uh, structure was that uh, there were 13 playwrights and that the artistic director was the playwright who was being produced. And so the company completely reconstituted itself, I mean completely reconstituted itself with each production. And it was also built on something called the implosion model, which basically meant that when they had done their 13 projects, they were done. And they wound up that uh, project with, um, they took the last little tranche of money and they used it to build a website. And then the website stopped working because that's how the internet works. Is the internet just, you can't put anything there because it will eat it and destroy it. It's like the Langoliers. And so um, I, what, what has made me feel so much sorrow around that is that there was so much wisdom just on that website about how to raise the money, how to get, how few people you can do this with how you might make a project of, of this type. And so um, the, the thing is, is that to have a conversation like this, everybody in the room here makes work. I mean, it's, this is a bias for us kind of room. This is a, half of the people in here are artistic directors I care about. <laughs> so um, uh, if, if possible, um, if, um, if, the, uh, if the microphones can go out, if people have um, their own ideas of, of of specific strategies and structures that they've seen work in the face of um, this sort of uh, financing tsunami <laughs> that we faced, uh, that we are still facing. Um, uh, I would love to hear about that. Um, you know what? I'm actually going to call on people. Kristen Marting is here. <laughs> Talk about a repository of wisdom. Kristen, what is the most um, what is the strategy? So in the same, same way that um, Caleb was talking about project number one, as having that be a strategy that he wants, I'm sorry, that they want to catch on widely, that it needs to be something that everybody does. Will you tell us about um, a strategy or a structure that you employ it here or employed it here that you also hope will, would kind of catch on like wildfire? Yeah, I mean, uh, the new work development model of made by the artists, in the artist's terms, every show is different. Every model is different. There isn't a model. <laughs> We're not making widgets. We're making something different every single time. Mm -hmm. And the staff really galvanizing around that was a really important principle for me. And we had projects that might take two years and projects that took six years, and that was okay. And that was the way that the artist needed to make it. Um, the living wage thing in a small theater, also something we've really wrestled with. You know, 
having redoing the budgeting process to be that, okay, we're gonna try to do everybody at $30 an hour. We're gonna estimate how many hours the designers are spending outside of tech and think about their compensation and not just do most favored nations even if a video designer is doing a buttload of work and there's one costume. Or if there's 50 costumes and there's a tiny amount of video design, they shouldn't be paid the same. So just thinking through how to remake that system. So doing that stuff, but as Caleb said, how you pay for it is the problem. And what you said about we all thought we were getting out of the pandemic and we were gonna get to the other side and things were gonna restore, and they totally didn't. Mm. And so now Lauren and the other three directors of here, <laughs> I'm, I've stepped away and they're inheriting that. And I was seeing a lot of possibilities and roads and ethical practice, but I, I personally was like, what are the new ways that we can get there? So it's exciting to listen to other people discovering new ways, because I had about 30 years of trying different ways. So it's exciting to me that there's um, new perspectives and new solutions. But I do think that it has something to do with the model that needs to be broken. It, it is broken, and we need to not try to protect these institutions any longer. Um, yeah. Well, and can I just say, I think the templatizing danger happens more and more as theaters are under-resourced and find themselves relying on a form that they know works just to get through things, to go quickly, get them done. And I think that leads directly to the kind of experience you were talking about where you feel like an independent contractor because there's nothing bespoke about what's happening production to production because in some ways we've created a system where the, the art feels secondary. And, and I think that that's one of the major issues that we should be talking about, that how do we, and, and that I think you're doing with putting artists first and giving a living wage, and some of us are doing with making sure our artists are on our boards and having a voice in every room, but how do we make sure that we don't build such bureaucracy by having an institution that it takes us away from being able to do the work more specifically? And maybe that goes to more of the process first question that you were raising, Will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Y'all want to raise some money tonight? Like, <laughs> we could do it all together and divide it. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's like, what, what are we going to do? It's, um, I'm not saying that in a sad way. I'm just really curious what we're going to do um, and how we... Mm, how, how we talk about... How we talk about the value of what we do. Because I think that has been a very, very interesting and sort of like fas fast fashion conversation in the last 10 years. Um, yeah, you go. Well, I mean, it just sort of lifting off of that, I think there is this uh, a reframing of ourselves within how we understand ourselves in society, how we positioning ourselves, and if the money does not exist in the traditional philanthropic streams for the arts, where is the money? And a part of what I sort of enter this space is, is working on a, a three-year national arts and health organization, working with local communities across the country who are basically working to access health dollars for arts projects by illuminating the fact that any of this arts work is healing work, it's addressing social determinants of health, um, it's able to sort of mitigate some of the burnout that clinicians play, you know training artists to be community health workers, et cetera, different models. But it does make me think, are we thinking enough? Are we making the case for ourselves? Or is there a danger that we're too insular as a field and as a form, and we're not actually reaching out to the folks? It's interesting to me that when we think about audience, we most often think of ourselves. And my, I'm, there are there is a, a non-believer to be reached clearly if we don't have the money in our hands, you know? I mean. I'm gonna harken back to what I was saying earlier, you know, and that is how are we making our organizations vital to the society in which we serve? How are we being of service, you know, to the industry, to society? And I think that that's very important. On That's one thing. But another thing, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm sitting two seats away from one of my very dear friends, uh, Dan Safer, whose company witnessed relocation 
I, I, I've worked with Dan for over 20 years. And, and, and one thing that I think that we as theater have moved away from is magic and embrace spectacle and embrace these big things, you know, like, and I remember Dan coming in with a plastic bag and making that into a, a, a video screen. You know, like, how can we embrace, one of the, not only Sing Sing, but we did a play called Counting and Cracking uh, a couple of weeks ago. Counting and Cracking was a small story that took place in Sri Lanka. The, the, the thing about that story was epic, it was three hours long, but the set itself was so magical and so simple. It was like kids that had designed the set. And it wasn't like that. They used to have a big set that was purely spectacle. And during COVID, they lost their set. So they had to create another thing that was, that was able to do the job in a way that was very creative. They got their set back, but they stuck with the, with the set that they made afterward. Because how are we embracing the magic? That's what theater can do that's not in competition with theater, with, with television, or with the films. Like, how are, we, how are we working as smartly as possible? Because we know that these, we know that costs are up, you know, on labor and lumber. So how can we reduce the costs, at least of the lumber, you know, and what can we do with that that brings people in, that makes people excited about the theater? I have a question. I'm just curious if anyone wants to talk about co-pros. No? Always. <laughs> what are they? I'm doing two of them right now. What is, what, what is, is it working? Like, what is it? Should we be doing it? What's coming of it? I just think if we're talking about, if we're trying to talk about resource and money, this is one thing that we're, everyone is attempting right now as, as an answer. And I'm just so, oh, Alistair, please. But, but Will, <laughs> I've participated in so many, yes. and I have no idea. Yeah. And I want to link it to something that Enver said. So I also do clothes, and I just relate very heavily to what Enver is speaking to, which is like, Forgive the family metaphor because the family metaphor is flawed, but it also is kind of how I entered into this industry, right? And so as a designer, are we like the step kid? We're like the cool kid who comes in with the normal family, right? But like we also understand that like there's only so much money for Christmas. Very that. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah. So when I do a co-pro and it moves uptown or it moves to a bigger space, I'm the person who's like, I also thought there would be money for haircuts. <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is coming in very late to me because I also have been waiting for six months for an opportunity to move this work, share this work. Yeah. Um, but I feel often, now, these are not current relationships. I'm not speaking on any of the co-productions that are happening right now. <laughs> But I will say that I love hearing, um, centering the conversation about what's happening in the building. And in my experience, the family metaphor still stands in that we feel that we have to protect the children from the income, right? So like, I would raise money for you. But I think there's also this like other question, which is like, who can actually afford to be an artist? Like who can afford to be a theater maker and at what cost? Like when I work in an institution and they offer me a fee that is not a Soho rep fee or is not a Broadway fee, and they offer me a budget that is way too low to make the work that I'm being asked to be made by the, by the director and the playwright, by the theater, then that costs me. It costs me my time, it costs me my energy, it costs me my money, and not everybody can afford to do that. And so we cut off this huge group of people who should be allowed to make work, who, should, who, she, who we should support to make work, and we can't support them. And often it takes people who are like, 
you know, the only reason I've been able to work so much off Broadway is because I'm married and I have a joint income. That is literally the only reason. Because if I cannot pay my rent, I know my husband will be able to pay it. That is literally the only reason. It's like we don't make a lot of money. And so there is like a real economical, like, there is like repercussions to the way that the work is made and the value that it, uh, that you know, is put on the different artists and different levels within the institution. And it, it like, you know, these are real things that we have to grapple with and we have to deal with and we have to figure out how to make it better for people, you know? I'm a tiny bit chatty, I will stop after this. But I, I, it's, a, it's a really important, sorry, it's a really important thing to talk about, you know, for the pleasure of running Rattlestick, I need another part-time job. Right, and the only reason I can continue to work like off-Broadway is because I have shows on Broadway and I right. live off a weekly royalty. Right. So it's like, but what about people that are just starting right. out who have like $80,000 of debt? Like it's, yep. you know. <laughs> it's hey, can, I, can I jump, I wanna jump in, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I have some stake in, um, and I think we all do in, a, in comments that Morgan made earlier um, in this conversation about PAC-B. Um, about BDS, and I'm wondering how that's like resonating with other, with, with uh, how that's resonating with artistic directors, other people in the room. I mean, I also have a thought running through my brain when we talk about, like when we talk about co-pros, I get these are like small move, like these are, I believe in pragmatics, right? I just wanna say something. But I wonder about a world in which like, what if every theater here went on, went on a strike for a year right? And what we actually did was like organize to get more state funding for the arts. Everything just moves toward privatization. Like when I go to Europe, right? It, it's got a different fucking feeling there and people make work differently. And I somehow think this is related, Morgan, to what you're talking about in terms of how we organize as artists. It's way bigger thinking. It is like you your art, your aesthetics are always going to be compromised when you are beholden to corporate interests and really rich people who want to keep that in their pockets. And I'm not just going on like a anti-cap. We know what we live in right now. But it's like, corporate right. It's family interests. It's what, it's what individuals want to say. Yeah. You know, but that's, it, it's, you know, <laughs> corporations have abandoned the arts. There's wait, no corporate, there's, 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 there's not a lot. There's I'll not. if you don't, just answer the question about Israel though. Like, I just like, but, yes, but just like, I love this question, but just don't let it, let it get lost. Okay. Don't let it get lost about the boycott question. You know what I'm saying? Because we're gonna go home and we're gonna see pictures of kids in bags. So like, answer the question. You know what I'm saying? Like, just answer the question. I just wanna, just, I so appreciate it and I don't want it to get lost in a bigger thing about corporate funding. Yeah, sorry, and, I'll stay focused, yeah. No, no, you, you asked the question. I was just, I was loving, I was just, my comrades and artistic directors, answer the question. That's my, that's my plea. And, and, and could you please restate the question? Well, your question, which is... My question is, Morgan, Morgan brought up, like, why, why aren't theaters signing on to PACB? Can you describe PACB, please, for... Oh, man, Morgan, Morgan, can you... Morgan, Pal yeah, yeah, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, which was, which was called for by Palestinians in 2004, and they called for cultural institutions around the world to first of all not perform in apartheid Israel, mm -hmm. but also to not accept uh, funding from apartheid Israel, and also to not um, program things that have been funded by apartheid Israel. Um, in 2014, the Palestinian Performing Arts Network called specifically on theaters, specifically on theaters. So, so right now, and, it, and I just love this question, because right now it's, it's okay to be like, wow, I've said no to the request that Palestinians have made, just to be in that discomfort, rather than to like, get around it on our slimy ways of kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm thinking about it. It's like, oh, you have, you have asked me one simple thing, because it's like, how do I show up? They've asked. Mm -hmm. they, said, they said it really, it's BDA, they are the clearest, they are every single I and T. So they've asked, and we've said no. 17 theaters have said yes, they're very small theaters. Theater Workers for a Ceasefire um, has a list of them, and, and, and safety in numbers, you know what I mean? Like, like, what happens when a whole cohort comes out? And then the rest of us, we can just sit in that and I'm a gay person, so like I lean towards wanting to shame you. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but um, <laughs> but I try not to. Um, but but uh, uh, so I, but I will say, if we wait so long, there's no consequences of our actions. We have waited too long. We have waited. We, we're just on the wrong side of history. So yeah, I just uh, so that's what Pac B is. It's very simple guidelines. Um, it's what actually most institutions, many institutions are already practicing, but it's naming it. You don't know any small institutions, it's naming it. 
Um, and uh, that's what that's what that is. This is. Um, already, as we know, I mean, I think everyone in this room knows, has already been a, an issue in um, a, a downtown in um, our theaters, that um, theaters that have been specifically asked to sign on have, have not done so. Um, and I, I think it might be an interesting... Um, I, I would, I would love, I, I don't want to f make any of the people who are on this panel feel trapped or tricked um, that we've asked you to say something publicly that you might not feel comfortable uh, saying, but it, it, it is a chance for you to do that. Um, so if you want to take that chance, I think this is the right time. Or I wish I could better understand. I, I feel like a baby. I make like $30,000 a year and I'm 40 years old. Like, what does it mean to your organizations to sign on? Like, or to not sign on? That's what I'm curious about. I don't even know where your money comes from, really. When I hear $3 million, I know it's jack shit and how much it costs to make a show, but why am I walking around like somebody's asking for this mic? It's very Sally Jesse. It's very Sally Jesse. Yeah. I mean, I can, I, I can feel comfortable saying that it is a conversation that we're having. Yeah. And it's a conversation that I think even in an organization of our size that um, not, every, not everyone aligns on. And I think that that's the, just like the reality of the place that we are right now as an institution is, and I'm not even talking about like board funders, whatever, I'm talking about like the seven people on our staff who are in conversation about this and who are debating and discussing and trying to understand the perspectives that we are all bringing. And I also <laughs> will not lie and say that like, because we haven't, I, I mean like one of the things we haven't talked about in this room and that there, and I don't know everyone in this room, but I don't know if there are funders in this room, um, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. But I think it's wrong to say that, like, uh, it's, it's, it's wrong to pretend like that fear of, of funding is not part of that conversation in a real way. And um, that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that in the conversations that we are having and the way that we are grappling um, as an institution and as individuals with how to respond to uh, anything happening in the world um, through the art that we make and through um, you know this this fundamental debate of just like as a theater is our responsibility to make a statement or to make art and that feels like a very central thing to what we're grappling with as well, especially because I think um, theater is slow and can be very slow. And we uh, are trying to think deeply about like how can we respond to things um, in a way that doesn't feel um, unthoughtful or um, and and like is it like how are we how are we just actually like deeply deeply grappling with that conversation every day, and that's I, I mean I know that that's not like maybe that's a non-answer but it's I, I think the best that I can be transparent at the moment is just to say that like we talk about this all the time. Anyone's welcome to talk to me. And I think if we talk about the crisis in theater, that silence just there, like that's big. Like I'm, I welcome talk, I'm not trying to shame anybody, but like the intensity around this question, you know, like that's big. I think there's a crisis that we're all in. So you're welcome to talk to me offline, but let's have the conversation. Yeah. So I think it's almost too Wait, much. I Oh, I'm so sorry. We, I beg your pardon. We can have the theater for a few more minutes. I know Helen you know has, a, has, a has to be someplace by oh, 7. Oh, at 7. No, 7.30. Great. Tyler, yeah, yes. Tyler, please, I'd like to. 
Well, I just, thinking about what you're saying, Jess, and thinking about what you're saying, Morgan, and how you summarized, Helen, in terms of response to despair being action, um, I do think, I'm thinking about what you said to freedom in terms of spectacle, and I'm thinking about ourselves as in some way spectacle makers, small and large, and just so really appreciative for you to even bring into the space, Jess, this what if we all shut down for a year and thinking about, you know, Freedom and I are working on a project in Montgomery, thinking a lot about organizing tactics of the 60s and so much of it. I mean, it's all direct action and actually the arts. It's like music and direct action, you know, and it's performative at scale. And so when we, th these are languages and vocabularies we use, we talk about scale, we, we talk about performance and players, and we stage all the time. And so I just want to appreciate that what you've said is not outside of our reach in terms of literally what we do. And what you've asked us to do in this moment is to imagine ourselves in the world that we're in and to maybe stop fighting what happens if we sort of surrender our like cling to our own form and industry, which will continue regardless. Someone will be making theater in a thousand years, you know, but Will our communities be ar around? Will, will lives, could, have li could more lives have been saved? And so just appreciate the grounding in there and maybe the invitation to um, think about our organizing power, not only for the plays that we can get produced, but the action that we could actually create. I'm just meditating on what you all are saying and, uh, and saying I appreciate it. Can I respond to like just a couple other things that were said out, not to like try to shift the topic, but I feel like there some th some other things were said that I Let wanted to. Let me just check just on time. It's six thirty. It's oh. six thirty. We have four minutes. Yeah. We've got okay. four minutes until we got to turn this room over. So Caleb, you have two yeah. minutes, and then yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to say two things really quick. Helen, I love how much you love 13P, but I also don't want to glorify it beyond for certain reasons. One, because I think in response to what Inver was saying about who gets to participate, 13P was amazing. I learned so much being a part of it. I was able to do that because I also had a day job. Everyone who participated in that experiment had a day job. No one got paid. I think if you look back at a lot of the artists that participated, they were also people who could do so because their incomes were being um, augmented elsewhere. So I just, I feel like we have to be very honest about those things, that like certain amazing things have happened because they were being subsidized in other ways and that eliminates some people's access. And I think we just have to be clear about that. Also, I want, to in to uh, Alsta and to Inver our, our costumers in the room and other designers who may be in the room. I just want to say there are three things that are um, plaguing us in the landscape of uh, foundation funding in the theater right now. One, foundations need to understand who is an artist. When we were working on project number one, we had to convince several foundations that designers were artists, not just playwrights and not just directors, who are also deserving of equitable and fair compensation. Two, uh, this trend of foundations to pause their funding when organizations go through leadership transitions, since we are talking about people who are recently taking over foundations, please someone try to tell me why that is a good idea, to set someone up for if, if everyone is saying we want to set you up for success in uh, this new era, this new leadership, and then a foundation says, oh, I'm sorry, our policy is to pause our funding for a number of years during a leadership transition. Absolutely detrimental. The third, uh, which I'm now having a brain fart and I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, the, the way, okay, so also the foundation's capping they're uh, uh, capping the amount of money that they give to a foundation or to an organization based on that organization's budget size. How is our budget size and our capacity ever supposed to grow if a foundation will not 
will actually help us get to that point. That's what I want to say. Exactly. So I think I've got uh, two sentences that sums all of that up. <laughs> um, uh, I'm always reminded whenever I am not scrolling social media because I don't have a problem um, uh, the, that one of the things that the outer world seems to find very appealing and very charming is when a group of school children band together to buy a car for the janitor who has been walking two miles to work every, every uh, day for 20 years. Uh, when um, a cancer surgery is crowdfunded or when people manage to kickstart a film. And the fact that that's considered heartwarming um, to this, this larger audience and to me is bone chillingly um, terrifying. The idea that my death will be crowdfunded, my burial will be crowdfunded, um, is is the thing that I want um, the arts to be the best at thinking its way out of. Um, as Tyler said, the language already exists. When Morgan talked about the boycott, they talked about South Africa. We're talking about solutions that I may have described them as new, are very old, and they happen to be the specialty of the people who are making the work. And that all of the fear that we have about what will the funders say if X happens, or all of the fear that we have of what will it be like if I have to be an artist and have a day job. I was a critic and I had a day job for 15 years and I loved it. It was all right with me. It wasn't the end of the world to have a day job and make art. And it's not that I don't want people who are beyond excellent at their work to be compensated fairly. It's that I don't want us to be afraid of not being compensated. Um, to me, that means that the thinking we do is actually about housing. To me, the thinking that we do is actually about getting um, uh, health care. That means that, we, that every decision we make isn't a life and death decision. Um, but it is, um, it, this is only the, obviously the very beginning of a conversation that has to keep happening. Um, and and I, I will say that usually when I finish a panel, I feel so joyful because I've met people who I was so excited to meet in all of your cases. And this time I feel um, like we're about to all step off a cliff together. It actually feels like frightening in my body right now. Um, and I think, I hope that that means that there's a possibility of change in front of us. Um, I want to thank the three quarters of the audience that stayed. I want to thank Frank Henschker for having us to have this conversation. And I want to thank this truly amazing panel. Thank you. <laughs>